So I'm going to start out, let's see, it's a small crowd, which is cool. I'll try to project. I'm not going to make a big deal about it, but this should be good. How many of you are network folks? What I mean by that is you've configured or you know how to run a router or routers, switcher switches, firewall firewalls, network services, DNS, those kinds of things. So this is a network kind of thing. That's not disrespectful towards the coders or application security guys, because we'll actually talk about a little bit of that, but it's just going to be touching on the edge of it. So based on that, how many of you know what flow information is, network flow? How many of you collect and or use network flow data? Okay, so I'm going to just tell you for just a minute what network flow data is, and this is a simple way of saying it. When you have traffic that you're sending out on the internet or transiting on the internet, network flow data pretty much gives you a few really critical things. Source destination address, source destination port, timestamp, you'll get protocol information. You can get other types of information in it as well. But generally speaking, and I'm telling you this straight up, it's, it's not payload data. This is not PCAP type payload data. Network flow data is just kind of like a network telemetry type data that's not user related, but it's transit service provider type related. Um, that being said, I'm going to kind of talk from that uh, mindset, and I'm going to mention a little bit, Dan, thanks for the intro, and some of you folks know me, and I've known some of you for years and years now, but, but uh, I work for the Utah Education Network. We're our service provider for about one point five, almost six million IP addresses. It's AS210 on the internet. We run six to seven peerings, uh, internet border routers. And it's a fairly decent sized network. In Utah, it represents 41 districts, school districts, all libraries, all charter schools, connections to a dozen higher ed institutions. And so it's funny, it's just big enough to be interesting, right? But it's not too big to not be able to see. Um, so we are a, a service provider um, from an internet service provider standpoint. I tend to, I have the opportunity to go to security conferences that are service provider related, um, security wise. So some of the things that I tend to really enjoy from our conferences here, you know, Saint or here DEF CON or even some of the stuff that's involved with the 801 group, <clears throat> there's not a whole lot of relation with some of the ways I perceive security. That's not to say it's special. It's just, Sometimes a little different. With that background being said, I was at a conference a few months ago. How many of you know what Twitch TV is? And who wants to just tell us what it is? It doesn't matter. Who? Okay, so who has a guess on how popular it is? Huge. Like I'm telling you right now, we went to kind of like a, a beer and gear kind of social type thing a few months ago at one of these presentations or conferences. And I was just shooting the bull, sitting down, enjoying kind of the crowd, chilling a little bit. And... I found myself sitting next to one of the Twitch TV backbone engineers, which was nuts. I mean, nuts. And we're sitting there talking, and generally speaking, and this is just kind of open information, I don't think there's anything crazy here, but UEN, you know, 1. almost 6 million IPs, 41 districts, all that stuff, we probably see a benchmark um, flow somewhere in the high teens, the high 20s gig, um, backbone-wise. But, um, and, and we'll see high watermarks that jump up into the 40s. But if we, go, if we get up into the 30s and start leaning up there, there's something wrong. Um, either it's start a school or there's a big update for Apple or something like that. But generally speaking, when we move out of like high teens, mid 20s, high 20s, there's something not good going on. So I'm sitting there talking with you knowing about that now, about somebody who's used to seeing 20, 30, 40 gig of backbone traffic in a service provider environment. And over the course of a couple hours, the guy mentions to me how they distribute that service, how they deliver Twitch to their customers, which is crazy. I mean, it's crazy. And it's interesting, like we would tend to think about core networks and backbone networks in a certain way. But when you start talking about like major global networks that are top five consumers, like commodity wise of internet band bandwidth, it gets to be a bigger deal and their architecture started to be crazy. So. I'm telling you this information just kind of as a secondary thing. But we were talking about some security things and how they actually scale to address security. 
Um, they don't scale vertical, they scale horizontal. That's an architectural thing. And so they had an 800 gig DDoS sometime in the last few months. 800 gig. I've seen campuses tip over at 40. I mean, just, they're done. Um, so I'm like, holy crap, man, how much bandwidth do you have the ability to transfer? He's like, we're about 1.2 ter. That's nuts. So I'm like, how do you mitigate it? How do you, you know, deal with that kind of an issue? And he said, we just eat it. They just eat 800 gig. So it gets me thinking about certain security implications. And that's kind of the place where I'm coming from. That's why I asked a little bit about your background and wanted you to know kind of where I'm coming from. This is my March Madness bracket. Okay? And there's a point to that. This is today's schedule for games. And this is today's schedule for B-sides. Right? So we're going to get this done. Uh, <laughs> this talk happened by accident. I'm telling you straight up. It wasn't a bad accident, but it wasn't a close call either. Uh, I'm on the committee with B-sides. Somebody invited me. I don't know if they'll invite me back. It's been really cool. But um, Sean asks, they send out CFP, the call for presenters, or we started to uh, get ready to send it out, and Nemus put together the code for it, and they're like, we need somebody to test. I'm like, okay, I'll test it, because I can type like the wind blows, you know? So I just typed in a talk that was a crazy idea that I thought would be cool, and it goes, and it's like, that didn't work, try it again. So I'm like, fine. And it went through, and he... He's like, okay, cool, we're good to go. And it was just one little blip, and Seth knows this and whomever else, on you know the way to the conference kind of things. All right, cool, CFP's good to go. We'll roll it out, this, that. And Sean's like, hey, thanks, JT, by the way, looking forward to your talk. <laughs> I'm serious. That's how it went down. So I spent a few months thinking, dude, I made that up. That is, that is, that's bull. This is bull. So... So it's a bit of an accident, but I want to tell you something. I don't necessarily know, well, I can tell you right now, I have no real idea personally, like professionally, about the implications of trying to wrap my mind around trying to feed a line of BS or to talk and where the truth may be and the fallacy may be and all that. So this thing about asymmetry, the abstract is kind of funny, you know, uh, Asymmetric warfare and correlation network defense. It just sounds like some dude made it up. But um, asymmetry literally means that you're attacking a target. You're intending to do harm or inflict damage on a victim in uh, a few different ways. There's this kinetic way. Kinetic is a force way, you know, where you might be shooting them or dropping bombs on them or whatever. And then there's the idea of cyber, and we could totally belabor that point all day. But this is an idea of asymmetry. You might have a target, and you might say, hey, I'm going to attack one aspect of their critical infrastructure from a cyber standpoint, digitally, if you will, but I'm also going to attack them kinetically. And that's what traditional asymmetry means. Well, even though it's an accident, I actually did think, are there multiple modes of asymmetric threat from a cyber standpoint that would actually be something you could try to identify and look for as a network defender. And I think that there is. I um, also want to you know, mention a disclaimer. If you think I'm up in the night, I probably am. But if you're interested in talking about things a little more, just hit me up because I, I think it's kind of cool and I do think there's something to it. In fact, I'm pretty sure there's something to it. And I'm sure I'm not the person who discovered it. I can tell you that right now. So the proverbial needle in a haystack. And I know it's been a little challenging AV-wise with this room, but there's the needle in the haystack. And here is just literally an exercise for me to demonstrate to you. Sorry, dude. Pick it up. Oh, okay. Uh, for me to demonstrate to you what it is that I'm trying to get at here. So... If you look, this is output from my terminal. And I did a couple things, real simple. Um, just basic and maps, I targeted triple w and org, right? That's where I work. 
And I did it from two locations. Uh, one of the locations was just right off the hotspot on my phone. And the other location was off of, I have a few VPSs, and this was like my San Fran VPS. So I just did an NMAP. That was all I did. And it was real easy. You can see what came back, TCP 80 and TCP 443. I know that the font is small, but I promise you that's what it is. And then I jumped into a flow collector, network flow collection uh, box that we run. And I started looking at things. Now, there's something that I learned a few months ago. And the software guys and uh, in the room might understand this a little bit better. But there's this concept of a manifold. Does anybody know who, what a manifold is from a software standpoint? How about from a security standpoint? Anybody heard the term manifold? Okay, so well, let me, I'll just tell you what, it, what a manifold is. And a manifold is exactly what that middle part says, where it says destination slash victim. I've got a command that's saying NF dump dash big R, and then it's got like some file locations, and they're actually timestamps starting at the beginning of the day and the middle of the day. And then I've got some filters that are saying, hey, I want you to look at the host, which is actually the IP address that resolves the triple W and dot org. And so there's a ton of traffic that comes back from that. I mean, you'd imagine, right? I'm talking it just will scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. But um, then I started to build the manifold. The manifold is, moving down to the second line, that I looked, yeah, again, at host, you know, 236.11 as it resolves. But then I also added to the manifold this idea of and proto TCP. I mean, a lot of traffic still. In fact, based on my NMAP scans and what I actually know just on the side, these were probably roughly the same, you know, besides whatever other, like, ICMP-type things or little things that people are looking for that get blocked. But the manifold keeps uh, growing. And I go to add proto TCP and port 443. So it's interesting. One of the things that I've learned along the way, and I didn't necessarily know that that's what it was called, but as you're trying to isolate things um, from a security standpoint forensically with network flow data, you're actually building a manifold of everything that's normal and everything that you expect to see and then it starts to get interesting. The things that you would expect, um, they go away as you build your manifold or build your filters. And the things that you didn't necessarily expect or start to be odd start to show up as your manifold as your filter starts to close them out. Yeah, Seth? So is your manifold a filter of normal? Yeah, it's a filter of normal. Yes, sir. That's exactly what it is. Thank you. Okay, so then the next thing is, and this is where we start to say, oh, JT's behind the scenes. Like, he actually knows what he's doing. Because I did this on purpose to show you all what I'm talking about or what I think I'm talking about. So moving down, source attacker, I've got another command. It's exactly the same as the others, but then I sat there and said, hey, show me the host, um, which is actually the IP for that San Fran VPS that I told you about. Yeah, I want to see proto TCP. I want to see port 443. And next thing you know, total flow count, summary total flows, four total bytes, blah, blah, blah. All I saw were the four hits that were just part of my initial basic NMAP scan. And the timestamps correlate too if you look at it. But anyways, so there's, there's a difference between what's going on at the top with me coming off of my hot spotted connection and what's going on at the top with me coming off of my VPS in San Francisco. Um, and that's the, you don't actually know that it was me. You, you wouldn't know that it was me. That has got an, a nature of asymmetry to it, right? It's coming off of a hotspot at IP location. It's called temporal locality. It's coming off of, of a temporal locality in one place and a temporal locality in another. But behind those two different temporal localities, there's one actor, and that's me. So that's kind of the point of what asymmetry is talking about. And that's the point where I'm saying if this sounds nuts, and it probably is. Um, so yeah. I did it on purpose, and it's only to illustrate the point that this is an easy way for us to understand what the crap I think this is, what I think we're talking about. And you might sit there and say there is a Jekyll Hyde nature to it, um, that we see the guy that's acting you know, totally normally coming off of a hot spot or coming out of some area in his country you know, and looking at things normally. But what we don't see is that there's the same actor with a second side to his face that's coming at us maliciously and trying to do damage. Um, one part of it's friendly and open. The other part of it is obscure and closed. Um, we're just about there. Who knows what the Internet of Things is? 
Who wants to help us out with what it is? Oh, man. Well, I didn't plan us to cut to the chase, but that's awesome. So let me give you what I think it is. I think you're right. So so the Internet of Things. Cool, cool GIF I stole off the tubes of, you know, a network-connected fridge, network-connected music, whatever, whatever that is down the... Anyways, I mean, if you just jump back five or ten years... Most of us would just sit there and say, yeah, we've got more devices that are IP connected in our homes than we ever had. And we probably expect we're going to have more devices that are IP connected in our homes in the future than we have now. Um, think about something, too, for a second, would you? And we're, still, we're going to stay on this slide, but like you got a Linksys router at home that's doing Wi-Fi. you got a, TV, a TiVo that's recording the TV shows that you care about. Um, you might have a few other things like the Nest controllers on the wall that are taking care of your temperature and things like that. These things are IP connected. Um, so when was the base image or firmware for that device compiled? Four years ago? Five years ago? Last stable, right, was more than likely not current because they're getting ready to deploy to a production base of tens, if not hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of consumers. So they're deploying a production base of software that is already behind. And when was the last time that you, or not to offend anybody in the room, but when was the last time that your in-laws or your non-technical uncle or aunt or whomever patched the firmware on their home Wi-Fi device, their router? They probably haven't. Now, how many of you in the room remember whether you've read about it or heard about it or whatever, I really don't care, when there was talk about highways, um, you know, like that you drive on with your car, being built in such a way so that they could also be used strategically to land airplanes in the event of a war. You remember? I remember. So think about this paradigm. I'm going to tell you that I think it's still here. I don't think that the highways that were being built in such a way architecturally to land airplanes are, you know, still what's being used. They may very well be, but I think that some of these things are baked into the cake when it comes to allowing for the use of commercial, civilian, critical infrastructures to potentially withstand a asymmetric exchange. And that's just me being crazy. But, um, but think about it. If that correlate makes any sense, that's what I'm proposing to you. Um, how many of you know who Dan Gear is? Black Hat 2014 luminary guy. He gave a talk called uh, Cybersecurity is Real Politic. Nuts, but awesome. I would download it. I would read it, highlight it, underline it, and understand it. Because he's going to touch on some of these things, um, I think. Um, I, I, I can't stand, well, I'm pretty happy about drama and I tend to be dramatic myself, but I'm not big on drama that really rolls us up and gets us riled up. And I don't mean to say, JT, you're seriously telling me that you think the modern day equivalent of us landing airplanes on highways because airstrips have been bombed out is now the Internet of Things being exploitable because of old code bases that are widely deployed and readily exploitable in case of national aid? Well, yeah, that's kind of what I'm telling you, but... I don't want to get too nuts about it. I'm not saying we're all going to burn and die. But it has brought me to this. When Sean was like, hey, dude, I need somebody to, to the group to check CFP and see if it works, and I just spewed my special brand of BS into that form, and it didn't, and I spewed that special brand of BS again with a little more lipstick on it, and it worked, and the function check was good, and then he's like, oh, by the way, I'm looking forward to your talk, it set me to thinking. And I am not sure if that accident or close call that wasn't intended to be a talk has got me thinking it was either a close call or it's too late. So, the talk's not really about asymmetry because I don't think that matters. I don't think asymmetry matters. I think if you've got a threat that's coming in from two or more directions, that you should mitigate each one of those threats as though they were an atomic threat. Not an atomic threat in like an atomic nuclear sense, but an atomic threat in the sense that it is a singular threat that you should take care of regardless of what other threats line up against it and may have a bad actor behind the scenes 
uh, orchestrating it against you asymmetrically. Because that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I don't think it matters. Um, I'd recommend, if you're interested in this kind of thing, or if you, you think that it's interesting, there's a gentleman by the name of Dave Meyer. Um, he was a distinguished engineer for Cisco, and then Brocade poached him and brought him over as their CTO. And he talks about this concept called robust yet fragile. Software side of it, I think Seth and I might have talked about this before. Not Seth. Is that uh, the more robustness or richness you deliver in your applications, the more fragile things become. Think about it. There's an inverse to that complexity. You can't build in complexity and expect it to remain hard. It won't. A great talk. He's probably given that talk more times than he's wanted to, or, but, but you can find stuff out there on him. Robust yet fragile, Dave Meyer. Dan Gear mentioned it, got a few nods. If you haven't read Cyber's Real Politic, I would recommend it. And even if this is just thought type work, just gee whiz, not to get you too far away from the day to day tactical stuff that you do, including myself, but this is good thought work type stuff, I think. Here's another one. Um, how many people remember that book that was called a. Uh, yeah, man. That's the one. This is very much akin to that line of thinking, but it has been updated, and it is kind of the Internet of Things thought with a current mindset. Uh, Paul Henningkamp. Then if you're interested in flow-related type stuff, you know, security as you would look at it from like a traffic or like an Internet traffic flow standpoint, this is based out of Carnegie Mellon uh, University in you know, partnership or uh, part of the Software Engineering Institute and the Network Security Association. But there are some really killer free tools out there at tools.netsa.cert.org. And if you're like, hey, man, I don't need to do that myself, but I would like to read some cool things from an, an uh, analyst standpoint, um, there's some awesome documentation along the line with it. And it talks about network security analysis and things like that, and so I'd recommend that too. Um, yeah, this is kind of, you guys know what core business process is, right? This is kind of the idea is I don't necessarily know that the true concern should be about knowing who the bad actor is that's trying to attack us asymmetrically or who owns the botnet, because seriously, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter. In my mind, it doesn't matter. Um, I don't think the core business process um, is a trivial many. I think it's the critical few. We tend to get lost in the weeds. Um, forgetting about the critical few and playing with the trivial many, and it just doesn't matter. So, anyways, that's my talk. It's time for a party. <laughs> Questions or anything, or you guys want to go play? Seth, go ahead. I'm not going to test the CFP like web page again, man. That's bad news. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't, you know what, you wouldn't actually be able to detect it. Um, so imagine if you were trying to identify a botnet that had two of thousands of hosts that were attacking you, quote unquote. And imagine you were actually seeing both of them and somehow correlated them, and I don't know how you would necessarily go about doing that um, from a, a traffic standpoint, unless you employed other types of tools. Um, that CERT organization, they talk about actually capturing things at a non-sampled rate for flows, which most people don't do, or capturing full PCAP data and then looking through those things or trying to correlate them with high-level tools. Um, but then imagine that you know second bot of the two dropped off, was patched, somebody mitigated the threat or whatever, and, and next thing you know, it's gone. I don't really know, and that's why I'm telling you, Seth, I'm kind of giving up on it. Because I think asymmetries exist, but I don't think they're important. Or I should say, I don't think they're as important as addressing atomic threats to the core business process. Asymmet asymmetry is a cool concept, and it probably exists. In fact, I'm sure it exists, but it's dumb. It doesn't really you know, have anything to do with our day-to-day -day tactical. In my opinion, I'm willing to be wrong. I, I'm, I'm saying like the, the, the threat surface is small. 
I, I wouldn't, I would, I would pay more attention to, you know, good firewall policies, vendor agnostic. I really don't care what vendor you run. I just, I don't. Um, logging, um, making sure you've got good patch schedules and some change controls. And I'm talking about the, you know, meat and potato stuff that we all think is just lame and not flashy. I would totally worry about that stuff that's meat and potatoes, uh, lame and not flashy before I would even start to care about asymmetry. Like, I seriously just thought it was killer, a lot of this information I was seeing and picking up and wondering and putting together. And then <laughs> I submitted the idea, the thought, just whimsically onto the CFP as we were testing it out. And it was more a thought exercise. That's all it is. Seriously, I'm not trying to waste anybody's time. It's just, just thought exercise. But... Yeah. 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 Like a uh, yeah, like a smoke screen. I agree. I I think it's important. I don't think it's the kind of thing that we would be. This is like TLA type stuff. That's what I think. Seth? So I, I think the end result of your thought exercise here yeah. brings us back to the importance of I think the end result of your thought exercise here yeah. brings us back to the importance of 